because of this level of interdependence that we see present in oligopoly, this idea of game theory comes up. It is far different to play solitaire versus playing poker. The difference being that interactions between people matter. In game theory, it's not just about what you're doing, but you have to know and be able to project what the other people are going to do. What are they going to react? How are they going to react when I make this decision? That's the idea of game theory. It gets involved with anticipation, with projecting people's reactions. All that comes into it. You know, if you look at poker, a very simple game, it's not about who has the best cards. It's about the way they conduct themselves. If I know you're a highly conservative paper player in poker and you suddenly put down a big bet, I can almost anticipate the fact that you have an incredibly good hand of cards and that I should fold. If we look back at game theory, if you... Uh, the excellent example, this is football. It is not the players that win games all the time. Coaches can also have an impact. The way they do that is by anticipating what the other team is going to do. If you give me the playbook for a team, and I know every play they're going to run, I guarantee you I can win that game, even with inferior players. And the reason for that is I can set defenses that will stop their offense, I can run offenses that have a high probability of success against that defense they're going to run. I could take a very inferior team. If I know you're running to the right, I could put all 11 players to the right. I think I can stop you because I can overwhelm the blockers. That's the idea of game theory. If it's third and long, let's talk about the days of Don Nealon. Third and long, what did we run? On third and long, we always ran a draw play up the middle. Did it ever work? The answer is no. The reason being that every team knew on a third and long we were going to run that. So rather than call a blitz, which is a traditional pass defense, they would stay back and wait for the run. That's how game theory works out. And you see this develop over time. It's not something that happens overnight. Now, Let's go over to this idea of coordination. This gets a lot of press. And you'll see in your chapter there are lots of examples of coordination that's happened. What they're talking about there is the idea behind an oligopoly is to, as a group, try to act like a monopoly. That's how you get maximum profits. While you are battling for these market shares, Wherever those lines are drawn, you're always trying to get a bigger piece of that pie. There's also another way to do better, and that is to grow the pie so that you all do better. And that's what oligopolies attempt to do. Not only do they battle with each other within here, but they try to grow the whole pie. And the way to do that is to act like a monopoly. If we're going to do that, we've got to coordinate efforts. Two things here. Number one is there's this idea of price fixing. Price fixing is explicitly illegal. The thing that the government needs to find to prove price fixing is that there's an explicit agreement. If an explicit agreement is found, it's price fixing, it's illegal, the government will penalize the companies. A legal method of doing this would be price leadership. Price leadership has evolved over time. So they pick one piece of this pod, maybe the biggest, maybe the smallest, you don't know. But let's label this as company A. In price leadership, they've come to a, let's say, uh, an understanding through game theory that whatever company A does, all the rest will just follow. They never talk, they don't communicate, they just follow each other. They play like follow the leader. This makes it almost impossible to find anybody guilty. Because to be a price fixer, there has to be an explicit agreement. The classic example of price fixing is OPEC. OPEC sets down at a table and decides who will produce how much oil. 
They look at this pie and they make it bigger for everybody. That's coordination. The reason they can get away with it, they're not in this country. But there are groups in this nation that have tried to do that. And you'll see many of the areas they've tried. And some of them are really amazing, the complexity of their plan. But they've all been caught, or for the most part. But this price leadership has evolved. If you look at Coke and Pepsi right now, the prices keep going up. You know, a two liter of Pepsi, I've seen as high as $1.69. Seems that the normal price is right around $1.40 now. I remember only a few years back, 99 cents, a dollar nine. That was the price level. Do you think it's really gotten more expensive to produce soda? I mean, the reality is no. It costs pennies to produce it. But because the two have worked together, they've actually increased each other's profits. You know, Coke, Pepsi, and RC have just followed each other up that chain. And yet, they do have temporary wars from time to time. It's that idea called predatory pricing. Predatory pricing is a temporary price reduction, and it is attempting to get people from this category, this company here, their customers, to try your product. Big example of that you see out here at the colleges. From time to time, they actually come out and give away pop. You'll see Vault or Rockstar or one of those come out and just give it to you. The idea being that you'll try it, you'll like it, suddenly you go to this company. But each of them knows deep down that that's only temporary. When the Big Mac goes on sale for 99 cents, it's not going to last. We know that's for a limited time. And that's what they're getting at. They're out there trying to get some more market share, but it's only temporary. Oligopolies do not compete on price. If they do, they all lose. They're interdependent on each other to keep that market growing because any one of them can destroy the entire market. Because of that, they typically have very high barriers. They're extremely aggressive in stopping anybody from getting in.